everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And our goal on these talks, the same as our goal at our SALT conferences, which we're excited to resume in September of 2021 here in our home city of New York, but that's to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts, as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And we're very delighted today to welcome uh, Lieutenant General Russell L. Honoré to SALT Talks. Uh, Lieutenant General Honoré uh, helps organizations develop a culture of preparedness and creates the mindset of problem solving. Take charge, le take charge leaders in the age of COVID-19 and the U.S. Capitol complex breach. Uh, he's an American hero who helped a New Orleans uh, city recover from catastrophe after Hurricane Katrina. He's been chosen to lead the security review of the U.S. Capitol security infrastructure, uh, interagency processes, uh, procedures, and command and control. Uh, General Honoré now shares candid and colorful leadership views uh, on how government resources, the private sector, and we as individuals can work together to overcome the current challenges facing the world. As the commander of the Joint Task Force Katrina, uh, Lieutenant General Honoré became known as the Category 5 General for his striking leadership style in coordinating military relief efforts in the post-hurricane New Orleans. Uh, he's a decorated 37-year Army veteran and global authority on leadership. Uh, when hurricanes such as Harvey, Irma, and Maria approach, news networks like CNN, Fox, MSNBC, and CBS consider him their go-to expert on emergency and disaster preparedness. And just to reiterate what Anthony said uh, before we went live, he's truly an American hero and one of the best among us. So we're extremely grateful for your time, General, and grateful to have you here on SALT Talks. Hosting today's talk is Anthony Scaramucci, who's the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, uh, which is a global alternative investment firm. He's also the chairman of SALT. And with that, I'll turn it over to Anthony for the interview. Well, John, thank you, General. I know you're from a very small family, and so I want to start right there. Tell us about that family of yours. Where were you born, sir? Uh, how many kids were in that family? And uh, and how did you get yourself into the American military? Well, good morning. It's great to be with you. Uh, honored to be with you. I was born in a little place called Lakeland, Louisiana. That's right at the end of the Bush Road, right next to the Alamo Plantation, a big sugar farm where we uh, farmed about 100 acres on a subsistence farm. And I say subsistence as opposed to a sharecropper's farm because that was a different uh, setup. Uh, we rented land. My father and mother I had 12 children. Uh, I was number eight straight boy in the family. And uh, growing up uh, poor in uh, South Louisiana on a subsistence farm, uh, it gave me some of the skills I needed to adapt and overcome in the army. Uh, when you're poor and you live on a subsistence farm, you learn how to fix things, Tony, Anthony. Uh, we, we, one time we had two televisions, two old black and white TV. And one had sound and one had a picture. And the young and the dumbest was sitting up there and moved the antenna around with some aluminum foil on it. So when I came in the Army, those skills uh, were useful to me because you learn to adapt and overcome. But growing up also in that family, you understand there's a hierarchy uh, in, in the group because uh, a family of 12 is like a team or it could be like a herd if you get out of line. And uh, that was a, a productive way to grow up. I wouldn't want to do it that way again because there was many downside to it, but it certainly uh, add to the old adage, uh, you know, you don't sharpen a knife with a cloth, you sharpen it with a stone. And it taught us all some lessons that what we get out of life, we're going to have to earn. And it reinforced what our public school teachers told us, Anthony, uh, if you get an education, nobody can take that from you. And you can do anything you want in America if you get an education and apply yourself. That said, I was the first one in my family to be able to graduate from college. Uh, but I also say all my other brothers uh, were more wealthy than I was because I chose to come in the Army. And you don't get rich in the Army. <laughs> they were mostly in the trades uh, and end up being contractors and build houses and in the skills. So that's a basic rudiment. I did go to 
what is known now as segregated schools again. Uh, some people, uh, we fought a long time to get rid of them that separate were equal, but I think I learned some great lessons from that and that continue to serve me today. And that is, uh, you can't drive this bus looking in the rear view mirror. We gotta look forward. We gotta take those experiences and use them to not let bad things happen again, but let's move forward. Let's improve our country and let's treat everybody with dignity and respect is what I learned from that experience. And I apologize for that long answer, sir. No, I loved it. I wanted to let you keep going. I think it's a, it's a brilliant answer and it, it speaks to your compassion and your empathy for people and also your aspirational thinking. I want to shift gears though, sir, because uh, we're in a time of uh, peril for our democracy. That's just my opinion. So I'll, I'll share that uh, with you. In January, uh, it was actually my 57th birthday, the 6th of January, uh, we witnessed a insurrection at the nation's capital. Um, Speaker Pelosi appointed you to lead a review of the security failures during that insurrection. Uh, why, why do you believe, sir, that it's important to take into account what happened on that day? It's important because if it was not for the work at the tactical level, the frontline officers, uh, as well as the DC police, Metropolitan Police Force, and a couple other small tactical moves that didn't happen. Uh, this could have been a total disruption of our democracy. While it delayed it in terms of time, and it's an embarrassment to our nation because we go around the world preaching to other nations the peaceful transfer of power. And here we are, the United States of America, who've preached to everybody about peaceful transfer of power, and we're not having one. We, we lost our innocence that day. And just, just one more point on that. Had those officers had not put their body on the line that day, and the insurrectionists had gotten to those two boxes, I don't think it would have uh, changed the outcome of the election or nothing else, but it certainly hell would have been a major disruption. Or if the mob had gotten to the vice president or to the speaker, it would have turned into a bloody affair by that time. And I'm glad it did not turn into a bloody affair, but it leads to the point we cannot let this happen again. We we had a situation where the rioters entered the Capitol building. Some of them looked like they had weapons and zip ties on them. How, how close do you think the situation was to becoming exponentially worse? Uh, again, I think if one of the principals had been attacked or had been uh, uh, taken, that would have made it exponential. And, and I think it would have been at that point in time where uh, shooting would have started at a lot higher rate than we saw with that one uh, person who got shot trying to get into the floor, on the floor. That in spite of everything, had, had this happened in any other country that I know of, and you could just name one. Uh, there'd have been a lot of people dead that day. And I think all of our uh, cultural shift to try to get officers to de-escalate things uh, on that day, I think we now realize we might have gone a little too far because we didn't have the non-lethal weapons ready. They weren't properly trained on them. They weren't properly maintained. And I think there's some soul searching going on in the federal law enforcement community. There's certain lines we cannot allow to be violated. And if you violate those lines, in my new mantra to the Capitol Police, hold the damn line. There's some lines that cannot be broke. And bomb rushing the Capitol is one of them. Because when the Capitol closed, our democracy stopped. Are you, are you concerned about the rise of extremism in the United States? Yes. And I'm very concerned of it among 
our people in the military and people in the armed forces and our veterans. Uh, for a long time, culturally, we have held our law enforcement people, our veterans, and those who serve in the military did in the highest esteem. But what we are finding out in reports released by the FBI and other government agencies and the Department of Defense, uh, the people who want to, uh, the domestic terrorist crowd has leaned on this uh, vigor for patriotism and saving the nation and we're the last line, the police, the veterans, and those in uniform, and, and they have exploited that, Anthony, to, to a point where they have found believers in the military, they found believers in the veterans, and they found believe in some servant police that in order to save the nation, uh, they must join this movement to challenge the results of an election which is the basic underpinning of a democracy. You know, our democracy is based on trust. Look at many things we do based on trust. You know, we, we get on the phone, we give somebody our number, and they take money out of our account. <laughs> you know, we go to the polls, we hit a button, and we vote for who we want. Eventually, all that's based on trust. And the insurrection is have tried to take our innocence because without trust in the democracy, the democracy won't work. But when that trust is challenged, as it was after the 2012 and 11 election, and the process worked, judges, uh, defense and attorneys, on, and attorneys on both sides go in and they run the machines and still there's no trust. Because of this agitation, that they didn't like the results of the election. If we lose that level of trust in America, we might still have a democracy, but it won't be worth living in. There, there has to be a level of trust that when government officials stand up and tell the American people something, that it is the truth the way they know it now, because the truth does change. I'm not a stupid. You know, when we look at this COVID thing we've been through, the truth changed many times, uh, but we also know there was some misinformation put in there that caused people to question when they see relatives dying and they're not sure if they're getting the real truth or if they're getting another version of some misinformation uh, thrown at them. So, again, I apologize for a long answer there, but no, uh, that was, a very, listen, I, are, that was are, a very deep question you asked. No, these are great answers, General. I I. I I'm not interrupting you because I want to hear what you have to say. You have some brilliant insight. I don't want to make this political. I know this is really about the security issues and the security shortcomings inside the Capitol, but I'm wondering if the information issue that you're describing, not just related to COVID, but also the political information and the facts that get misconstrued uh, where we as a nation sometimes now are, are actually we can't even argue or debate because we can't even agree on the facts, sir. And so what I'm what I'm wondering, based on your experience, your love of country, what are some things that the United States can do to try to reconnect itself and to bring back that civic virtue uh, that, that you've basically lived your life by? How do we do that, sir? Well, I'm not quite sure if I have a good answer for that. That's why we've got the salt talks. And uh, you'll bring a future that's who probably written books and spent their life studying that. I do know the basic underpinning of patriotism as I learned it. That you love your country sometime when your country don't love you. Or it may appear that way. And, uh, you know, we hold a Supreme Court in highest esteem. But I remember as a young boy when the Supreme Court said separate but equal was okay. Yeah. So, but things have changed. And I think they've changed, continue to change for the better. But we've got to understand it's not just the disruption that was going on between people and trust in our country that 
this is being influenced by outside agitators. And I do believe that. There is foreign intervention to see that a democracy like ours does not survive because there are strong people in power in other nations, influential countries around the world. I mean, what China has put their president in for life and the elections that happened in Russia are a perfunctory thing that just, and they keep electing the same guy and he puts his opposition people in jail. There's a big push not to have a democracy like America being the, the beacon for democracy around the world. And they're, they're in here. They're influencing people in the hinterlands in America because they are coming in through the Internet. Right. They're coming in through social media. And you know the thing that really scares me? They're reaching our youth. They're reaching young people. They're, they're young people. When I grew up, I was in the 4-H club and the Future Farmers of America. That was it. Influenced by some great teachers and coaches that talked about leadership, that talked about love of country. And when we stood there and pledged allegiance to the flag, there wasn't a pin dropped in the room. There was no sidebar conversation. Now, young people are being influenced by going on the internet and somebody spewing vitriol hate among people because of their ethnicity, because of their religion. I, I wasn't exposed to that, but I know my children and grandchildren are, and I know many young people across the country, and that information operation is attacking our country 24-7. And it's not bad they do it one time, they save it on YouTube, and people can go back and watch it again. And, and that's why it's important to have programs like yours that try to bring information to people that we have to be aware of this outside influence in our government and in our culture. It, it could change America. And, but I, I do have a belief that every generation in America has a war to fight. The greatest generation fought it in Omaha Beach. This generation will be fought in information mm -hmm. operations and in influencing from people from afar because the greatest threat to a democracy from uh, like ours is a threat from within when people lose confidence in the government. And we see that happening that the people are questioning the veracity of our elections, questioning where did the virus come from, questioning the significance of the vaccine. Everything is challenged because that steady stream of information from the outside has one thing in mind, and that is the disruption of the United States as we know it. But it's not just from the outside, sir. We have political leaders in our country that are fomenting those lies. Uh, they could be fomenting those lies related to the vaccine. They could be fomenting them related to the veracity of our electoral process, uh, the, legit the legitimacies of our election. And so um, you've called for uh, some, some people to be put on no-fly lists uh, that are uh, potential threats or potential domestic terrorists. And these could even be people that are former military people, as you just pointed out, or people that are formerly with our police departments, uh, state and local police. Um, I, and I'm not asking you to wave a magic wand, and none of us have it. But if you were the czar and you could lay down some of the tenets, the groundwork to reunify the country. Uh, one of the great things about the Army is that people are coming from all the 50 states they unify and bond together in the army. You know, you mentioned the uh, World War II. My uncle Anthony, who I'm named after, he was on Omaha Beach. He he was uh, he was a decorated veteran. Purple he won the Purple Heart in in France on behalf of the country. My uncle Salvatore fought in the Battle of the Bulge. Um, and when they came home, they had friends from all over the country that were part of that effort with them, and they felt more close 
as a result of that. Today, with less than 3% of the country tied to the military, one and a half to 2% in the volunteer services and then their family members, we don't have that connective tissue that we once had. And so my question, sir, is how do we get it back? Yeah, that's another one of them uh, 60, what's that show used to be the $64 million question. <laughs> and I wish I was smart enough to handle it, but I'll take a shot at it. I think we need to almost try to spend an equal amount of time about what's going good in our country. Definitely. You know, there's a, there's an old song that came out. Uh, is there any good news today? You remember that? The kind of a country... Sure rain to it. Uh, I think it's important to for folks to know that uh, with all our problems, there are a lot of beacons of light happening around the United States of America. I mean, we've given the world a solution to the virus, which is a shot uh, that if people take it, with all the facts we know, and I had it myself, I had my first shot on Christmas Eve and never doubted because I learned to trust the system. We have to have a, a sufficient amount of trust in the democracy to make it work. That there are a lot of things that are going well, but it's not equally uh, being distributed among the people where poor people working for minimum wage are struggling like hell. Uh, because we're still using last century uh, pay and equity. When I talk to CEOs, uh, Anthony, about uh, creating teams in the companies, and you create teams by making sure everybody understand that everybody in the company is equally important. Whether it's the guy down in the computer room that's watching the blades to make sure they run right or the security guard at the front desk or somebody in the sweet speed, everybody have to feel equally important in the company and respect it. <clears throat> and everybody needs to tie into the mission. And to accomplish that mission, we need everybody to do their best. But when the missions accomplish it, much like General Washington and his troops who uh, saved us from the British Army. Everybody, when we achieve success, must benefit from the bounty of success. It's not just the C-suite that get all the new Range Rovers or the company acquired a new jet. That guy that secured the front door, that front and back office staff that make things happen. Everybody has to benefit from the bounty of success. And I was looking at one of our great companies, Amazon. What, what a miracle in commerce. But again, they will look at themselves. If people don't benefit from the bounty of success, they, I think they lose their connection to the mission. And when they lose the connection to the mission, you start seeing the tires come off the truck and the paint start to peel. And I think industry as well as government need to make sure that we are being inclusive of everybody in the country. Look what happened with the essential workers. How many people paid respect to somebody who checked your groceries out at the store until the pandemic happened? Or in the hospital, the person maybe did not graduate from high school or got a GED that's coming in and cleaning up elderly and sick people. Or the person that maybe did not make it through nursing school, but now wanted to help others from the heart and in an elderly home, taking care of, of uh, elderly patients with multiple uh, health issues they're dealing with the guy that cut the meat in the slaughterhouse and the truck driver. I think it gave the next generation an appreciation that, yeah, my dad's a truck driver, but without that truck, you don't get your high screen TV. You don't get that new 
a foreign car you bought. You don't get bread on the table. You don't go to the restaurant and get, I think we have to capture that and ensure that we uh, bring this forward as a lesson from operating in an economy under a pandemic for a year to being more inclusive of everybody being on the team. And when the country succeed, when the company succeed, everybody need to uh, participate in the bounties of success. And we got some work to do there. And that's hard to do the way we've constructed our economy and the way we've constructed uh, uh, how we help people who need help. Like, it would have been a no-brainer 10 years ago to declare pre-K education as a national standard. What the hell? You know, five years ago, we should have claimed uh, junior college and skills, a no-brainer. You just go to school. And we need to fix that. And we're going to continue to be the innovation leader in the world. That's the message I tell CEOs. That's a great, great message. I, I appreciate it, sir. General Honoré, uh, Anthony gives me the, the privilege of asking some questions on these talks. So I'm going to jump in with a few follow-ups. You talked about on January 6th how the Capitol Police, <clears throat> they, they both suffered from a, a lack of organization and preparedness, but also there was, you know, heroes on the front lines of that situation that prevented it potentially from becoming bloody uh, and people, more people losing their lives as a result of that day. What specifically uh, in your findings did you find that they, you know, mishandled from a preparedness perspective? How can they improve on, on being more prepared for similar types of situations. One of your recommendations also was putting up a, a fence around the perimeter of the Capitol in the short term to try to uh, address all these sort of systemic uh, vulnerabilities in the system. Is that going to be a permanent function of our society whereby we're going to have to construct fences and, and put up barbed wire to prevent sort of domestic terrorists from, uh, you know, committing, you know, murder or, or other crimes? Uh, or are we going to be able to find a way to deescalate things at a more systemic level to prevent that? I've been around the world a few times, John. I'm glad you asked that question. And there's no other national capital that you can just walk up to, show your driver's license, or your teacher sign you in and, and stroll around the capital. No other. If you know of one, tell me where it is. We've preserved something through the 246 years of our, of our nation that few other democracies or any other government would allow. And that is the right for citizens to come to the Capitol. Because one of the cultural things that every member on both sides, the House and the Senate, which is hard to them to agree on what time of day it is, that's a lesson I learned that we ought to talk about a little bit sometime. <laughs> and the two-party system, they all agree on. We want the capital open to the public. At the same time, General, we don't want another ability for one six for a mob to rush the capital and disrupt our democracy and put people's lives at risk and people losing their lives. So th that's the underpinning challenge. What we found was it, what happened before, during the event, uh, what happened before most of our operations start with uh, preparing and how do we prepare? What are the threats? And there was an assumption by the Capitol Police Board that the crowd that was assembled under uh, former President Trump would not be violent. That, that, that assumption uh, is words, I'm using their words that they use in testimony. I'm not making this up, right. nor was it our job to look at this. Our job was to recommend what needs to be done to prevent this from happening again. Intelligence, there was a failure in intelligence. And I think that failure is systemic because even yesterday you saw 
I saw, watched the uh, hearing with the FBI director saying, well, it was just internet chatter. And I'm saying, wake up, dude. In the 21st century, internet chatter is intelligence. We're still going back to that vision of intelligence of some World War II where you've got a guy stranded on an island, but he, he can listen in on the Japanese or the German radio net. And that's the kind of intelligence they're looking for. They say they're coming at dawn. Right. There's at least six ships. This is the direction they are moving in. That is America's vision of intelligence. We don't believe it when it's in plain sight. They didn't believe it an hour before the attack when people said, go to the Capitol. They still didn't believe it. That the FBI, in their transition of what they had that was on chatter, the Capitol Police major problem with handling intelligence. And we recommend it that they include so many officers in intelligence that they rework how they use intelligence and redefine what they think is intelligence. Because they are looking for intelligence to arrive uh, in a folder with secret marks on it, with a, with a, uh, a plastic stamp where you got to open it and you send everybody out the room and you look down and you look at the source. That's not intelligence in the 21st century. Right. We have trouble dealing with people operating in plain sight. Because as American, we confuse television programs like the West Wing with real life. We confuse programs like NCIS that we know everything that's going on. But if it's happening in plain sight, it can't be that bad. Right. And I think our entire uh, intelligence gathering system in America uh, need to be refocused because they're doing it in plain sight. People coming on television say, we're going to the Capitol. They're saying it on the And we discarded that. And we know what happened, John, as a result of that. Uh, that was an intelligence failure. There was a failure on the part of the training of the officers in the Capitol. We recommended adding officers. The Capitol at the day of the attack was about 183 officers short. Some of it from COVID and some of it they didn't have a class last year. They were short of the authorization. We recommended adding several hundred officers to the Capitol Police Force because last year they consumed 720,000 hours of overtime. And you and Anthony know looking at businesses, if you're using that much overtime, you probably need to hire some more people. All because right. if you're using that much overtime, people are working six, seven days a week. And that needed to be fixed. So they don't have time for training. We also recommended those fences you talk about. But we're not talking about the green zone fences you saw around the Capitol. We're talking about re-engineering fences through the, with the Corps engineer and some of the lands, best landscapers we got in the country and in the world to embed those fences in the ground. So if we saw something coming, like happened on one six, that fencing could come up, give law enforcement time to respond, to get enough officers there. So people clearly know you violate this fence, you're gonna be arrested or you're gonna be shot. That sign has to be on the fence. You violate this line, you're going to be arrested or you will be shot. You can't violate the line. But as you saw, what we had was uh, equivalents of bicycle fences that we put up to control parades. And that was inadequate. It worked for 246 years. It didn't work that day. So we need to be more innovative and the approach I gave to the Corps engineers is they think about the Disneyland look. You go to Disneyland, there's one place to come in, one place to go out. And you never realize how they have used landscaping along with fencing
to get you at the right place. And that's the appearance because we don't want the capital to look like the green zone, but we cannot allow one six to happen again. Right. So you sort of became famous in, in the public consciousness for your response to Hurricane Katrina. Um, you know, you came in, the government sort of initially bungled elements of the response. There was anarchy in certain uh, parts of New Orleans. There was a, a great podcast miniseries that I, I recently listened to from The Atlantic about the entire situation. But you came in and you took control of the situation. Uh, but what did you learn from that experience about human nature, about how people sort of naturally respond to adversity, the way in, disinformation spreads um, in a stressful environment? and how to sort of remedy that environment. That could apply to something like a capital insurrection. It could apply in business. It could apply uh, in, in public policy. But what did you learn about human nature from that experience and how to take control uh, of complex situations? Yeah, I, I think people from that experience and, and many others in military experience, 37 years, I think people are looking for somebody who is the leader that is going to take responsibility for what they say. And I had the unique uh, position of not being an elected officer. You know, I, I, I wasn't elected by the people and I was unencumbered by worrying about if I was going to get elected again. And that's a hell of a burden our politicians carry. That's why I would never be a damn politician because they have to worry about how this is going to affect their, their next uh, election cycle. And because on my arrival on a Tuesday evening, on Wednesday morning in New Orleans, uh, I realized that the mayor of New Orleans, he's a senior elected official. That's what they teach us in the military. And you, help them do what they're going to do. And the senior person in Louisiana was the governor. It wasn't the president. They were in charge. And I think people were looking for by that time is this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do it. Now go make it happen. Damn it. Uh, because I think what people are looking for in leadership is a execution that leadership is not about getting people to do what they want to do. Leadership is about getting people to do what they don't want to do. Hell, you can get everybody to take off early on Friday or go to lunch together with you at the, at the lobster fest on Thursday. But how do we lock down and say, Hey, we got a 36 hour close down here. And I know some of you were planning on going to the beach or spending time with your family. We got to get this done. Leadership has got getting people to do what they don't want to do. And more often than not, politicians want to tell people what they want to hear, not what they want to do. Right. And it's very ingrained in our politicians not to take responsibility. Look, the hurricane broke the city. You don't have to defend that. The hurricane won. We lost. Go with that. As opposed to saying, well, the state didn't give us what we needed. Are we still waiting on the federal government? Hey, look. The hurricane broke your city and put 17 foot of water in it, bud. It ain't a damn thing the president can do about that right now. <laughs> Other than to help you. But there's something we've taught in the political coast, Anthony, and maybe you can help fix that, that regardless of what the disaster, uh, blaming some branch of government at the time is happening is not the right answer. And too much of that was happening, and people didn't know who to listen to. We listen to the mayor, or do we listen to the governor, or do we listen to national media who flew in on their corporate jets, got in there, and basically beat me there. So that was some substantive problems we got to deal with and we have dealt with. But I think people in a disaster are looking for the voice. In 
there was a mayor of New York who since, you know, burned his candle out. But people were looking to him. People were looking to our president, President Bush. When he said this will not stand and they will hear from the American people, he wasn't bullshitting. And he laid the hammer down on those who attacked our country. I think people are looking for those moments and people are held in high esteem when someone walk up and said, we're going to work on this together. And as opposed to uh, different levels of government saying different things. And as we saw the days and weeks after Katrina, it became the blame game. And I wouldn't play in the blame game. Right. We're here to save lives and take care of people. And I think it's we'll well said. Done. Yeah, we, we've built great institutions in this country that, that we think are resilient, but leadership matters. And, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, we're experiencing that. But uh, Lieutenant General Russell Honore, it's such a pleasure to have you on Salt Talks. Uh, we could go on for hours with you uh, extracting your wisdom, but uh, we hope to see you on the media still talking about the insurrection, talking about these issues that are facing the country. I think you have clear eyes about everything that's going on. So, so we need your leadership more than ever, but thank you so much for joining us. General, you mentioned people's candles burning out. Your halogen lights, sir, sir is shining very brightly. Okay. We, we want to make sure we keep you in the, one of the main focuses of our country. You're a national treasure. And it's a big honor for us to have you with us today. Thank you, Anthony. It was an honor being with you. Now you'd be well, sir. Bye. And thank you, everybody, uh, for tuning in to today's SALT Talk with Lieutenant General Russell Honore. Just a reminder, if you missed any part of this talk or any of our previous SALT Talks, you can access them on our website on demand at salt.org backslash talks or on our YouTube channel, which is called SALT Tube. Uh, we're also on social media. Twitter is where we're most active at SALT Conference, hopefully not spreading any uh, disinformation there. Uh, but we're also on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. And please spread the word about these SALT Talks, these conversations in particular, like the one we had uh, with the general today, just understanding what it takes to combat some of the polarization and extremism rising in our society today, we think are, are very important. Uh, but on behalf of Anthony and the entire SALT team, this is John Darcy signing off from SALT Talks for today. We hope to see you back here again soon.